the Senate Judiciary. Um, it is September 8th, um, 2020, meeting once again remotely. Um, this morning, we're going to continue our conversations about S-119, which is a bill that passed the Senate during the um, first, the second session of the set of this year's biennium. And we're now in the third session and the house has taken it up and has made significant uh, changes and expansion, as well as the governor's executive order um, does deal with some of the things that we were dealing with in S-119, but um, it also deals with things that was in that were in S-124 that is mainly a government operations bill that Senator White's committee is looking at. So today we have Julio Thompson um, from the Attorney General's office, the head of the, um, the division um, on racial justice. And I was hoping to get some uh, information from Julio regarding both of those matters. One is the significant house changes that seem based on a, on a Seattle law, <clears throat> as well as how he sees the um, governor's um, executive order fitting in with S-119 and S-124. But since S-124 okay. is a government ops bill, maybe be focused more on 119. Okay, I'd be happy to do so. So for the record, I'm Julio Thompson, <coughs> Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Attorney General Civil Rights Unit, um, talking to, with you this morning about S-119. Um, as the committee knows, the version of S-119 uh, that passed the Senate uh, passed with our office's support. We, uh, we embraced the California, basically what's been called the California Standard uh, for including a necessary standard. Um, we we uh, believe that um, the standard really applies to all uses of force by law enforcement, not just deadly force. And I think there's language uh, in the as passed version of S-119 that uh, extends beyond um, a deadly force, which is a small subset of all the force uh, that, that officers may use uh, in, in their career. Um, I think the uh, the reference to the executive order it, it, um, it is uh, pertinent, or I think it's related to the the proposed language um, from the House, because what the House is trying to do, um, it appears, is add more detail to fleshing out the uh, the necessary the California standard, <laughs> uh, and to do that in statute. Um, <clears throat> Typically, the and and uh, you know what's regarded as best practice in law enforcement is that the really detailed policies that identify the many different situations or try to address the many different situations that that officers encounter in the field is is really something you do through pol uh, through a policy, uh, in part because the. Um, policies are amended uh, and tweaked a lot more easily uh, in light of real life uh, situations that officers encounter uh, in the streets. It's a lot easier to do that than to do that through the statute. Um, and because Vermont's legislature isn't a full-time legislature, um, you could have situations where a department might, um, uh, with, with community input, might want to refine its policy, but might be stuck in a period of time where they can't train away from a given standard uh, because a statute it, it is what it, what it is. So um, I think that the idea, the, the core principle that the, all of this, all state law enforcement should have the same standards for their conduct, the same training that comes out of the academy from both the recruit and continuing ed education is something we embrace. So um, it seems to me if there's going to be a development of unified use of force policy, uh, the material that we, that we're, the language that we're seeing from the house would be something that you would normally encounter in such a, in such a policy. 
uh, which would be broader even than the language that they provided here, but it would be, it would be part of that. You're muted, Senator Sears. Um, how did the section, some of the sections get in? Um, it looked like what they did was we passed S219 and um, it appears on, we, I'm looking at the side by side <clears throat> and a law force officer shall cease the use of deadly force as soon as the subject surrenders or no longer forces an imminent danger of death. So how do you, how does a law enforcement officer um, So you're permitting a use of deadly force until it's no longer necessary. That's I've had trouble with that piece. Um, and uh, the, also it appears to um, a law enforcement officer may use a prohibited restraint in a situation where use of deadly force is justified. justified. So it seems to undercut what we passed in 219. Did, uh, was that part of the Seattle model or was that something that they came up with on their own? Or? About about the use of a, a, well, a neck the, restraint? The, the, yeah, that you, could, you can do a prohibited restraint if the situation warrants. Uh, it's pretty, I, I don't have the Seattle po policy in front of me. A, a lot of law enforcement policies it, within their deadly force policy or a subsection of their deadly force policy will address neck restraints. And those that prohibit it typically say, um, you can't use it unless deadly force is warranted. In other words, if the circumstances are such that the law and the policy would justify the officer discharging his firearm, um, and, and there may be, uh, and I think you've heard testimony early in the sum summer from Drew Bloom on the subject, there, there are circumstances where deadly force might be warranted um, or, or there's the officer or someone else is in a near death situation and using a firearm would be more hazardous than using some other type of force. So I think the illustration he offered, for example, was two officers on the ground or an officer and a sub suspect on the ground and there's a struggle for the officer's firearm. And maybe this, the, uh, the suspect has control of the officer's firearm and then another officer um, has to decide under the circumstances what force to use before that gun goes off. And if the circumstances would allow that officer to discharge his firearm to strike the suspect and, and keep him from using the gun against uh, the officer's partner, then the officer would be allowed to use a neck restraint, which uh, carries with it while it presents a deadly threat to the suspect, doesn't can carry the risk of inadvertently harming the, the off, other officer who's on the ground, who might be struck with a ricochet or a stray bullet. So I think that is uh, under those circumstances, if an officer is faced with defending their life or defending the life of another person, you will see uh, pretty commonly for policies that address that, that a, a, a prohibited restraint is uh, per permissible. And I think S, I don't have 219 in front of me, but I think 219 made reference to the self defense statute, yep. um, which would include defense of life. So you can, def you can defend uh, your life or the life of another person by use of a neck restraint. That's the law that applies to every person in Vermont, not just law enforcement officers, right. self defense but, statute. Um, I'm, I just want to follow up with one more question, then I'll go to Senator Bruce. Okay. I think the concern that I have, and that of many is, we seem to have nationwide, and even in Vermont, difficulty holding um, what I'm going to refer to as bad cops, which is a very small minority of all the police officers in the state, but holding those folks accountable. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's been many cases where uh, behavior has been extremely questionable and we seem to have a hard time. So I, I guess, you know, that's kind of my response. And I don't want to do things that are going to continue 
to um, exasperate the situation where the rogue uh, gets away with stuff um, when they perhaps shouldn't. I don't know if Senator Bruth was questioning in the same way, but that, that's my concern. Uh, well, I, I uh, really an informational question for, for Julio. Um, Julio, if, if uh, I believe 219 and 119 strike the justifiable homicide statute. Um, and it was my understanding that a police officer, even without that, would have a remedy if they were on trial where they could make a self-defense argument, either from common law or some other area of statute. Is that true if, uh, if we didn't add a protection here or if the uh, justifiable homicide statute wasn't available to them that they could still argue self-defense? Um, I'm a little unprepared to, to really respond with an analysis of 219 since I was called on 119. I don't have that, I don't know if Bryn is able to, like well, I don't recall the language off the top of my head that uh, that struck the existing self-defense statute. Vermont's, well, whether whether it does or doesn't, is, isn't there okay. always a remedy in, in self-defense? Well, I mean, Vermont has another statute that says unless uh, directed by the legislature, then the common law applies to Vermont. And so the legal question would be, I don't know the answer because I haven't had a chance to think about it, but uh, the question would be, if language just struck a self-defense statute, then someone who who sought what it what it you know what does that mean? Does that reflect an intent to remove the self-defense uh, standard um, that's available to all criminal defendants? Um, that would be the question, really, because unless there was language that said the common law principles in Vermont for self-defense. Uh, hereby apply. Um, so whenever the, the legislature elects to regulate something or set a standard, and then it repeals it, the question for a court is always going to be, well, why'd you repeal it? What is the state of affairs that you intend? But if um, there's another, if, if, as you say, there's another statute that says in the absence of a proactive directive from the legislature, then common law applies, then striking a statute isn't the same as having uh, a statute. Um, well, I, I don't means. have that common law statute available to me. I mean, I was okay. just paraphrasing it. Um, but I mean, that, that would be the question really, would be what the, uh, and, and, and we do have ledge counsel here, so I don't know whether Bryn has, uh, oh, I see it, it is the, um, 219 says that the justifiable homicide statute will be repealed next July. Yeah. So it's not repealed now. Um, and the question just becomes what, you know, what you replace it with. And I don't, I don't know that we have a view about pr proposed language for the justified homicide statute. Uh, so that's not something I can, I, I can really address. Um, I do think, I mean, in common law, um, uh, and we, we have others on this panel who are uh, more familiar with this than I am in the criminal context because I don't practice criminal law. But, um, but in common law, it's if someone is facing you know, imminent threat to their, to their life or the life of other people, uh, then using force for the protection of self or protection of others um, you know, is a well-recognized doctrine there are lots of variants of that central doctrine, though, such as um, whether you provoked the, you know, the the uh, the confrontation to begin with. What other alternatives you have to using the sort of force that you're using, and so that's why, um, you know, some jurisdictions have elected to put that in statute rather than uh, rely upon judge-made law um, for the, for the reason cases. I bring it up is. Senator Sears, I think, is exactly right, which is, as we began to, um, 
as a society, as a nation, we began to look at why police officers are practically speaking, never prosecuted for crimes like this or successfully prosecuted is in my own opinion, because over the years they have successfully lobbied for layer upon layer of protection, union protection, protection by statute, common law protections, which were always there. So there are, you know, if you're a prosecutor, prosecuting the officer who uh, choked George Floyd to death, you're facing an uphill battle. So we had a lot of discussion in passing 219 about if we um, prohibited the restraint, flat out, full stop, prohibited it, um, and an officer did use it in the last resort, it was my understanding that they would have a remedy at law, um, even without the justifiable homicide statute, which, as Julio pointed out, is due to be struck under 219. So just, Bryn, if I could, if I could just ask that general question, um, I don't, I don't think that we can, basically, I don't think we can get rid of an officer's right to make a self-defense argument in that case, unless we were to specifically prohibit common law. Is, is, you haven't, but I think Brent is about to tell you why that is, because we okay. only repealed section three of that justifiable homicide statute. But- okay. You well, asked Bryn, so I shouldn't yeah. have jumped in. Yeah, let's ask Bryn. <clears throat> um, good morning, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative, Co Legislative Council. Um, I thought that it may make sense for me to start out by saying that um, the some members of the House Committee have worked on a, on a new draft of 119, which I have just shared with Senator Sears. Um, and it makes a change that, uh, <laughs> that um, alters this conversation pretty significantly. So I think I should share that if it's all right with the committee, um, which is that. Um, Go ahead, please share it. Okay. It, rather than repealing that um, subdivision three of the justifiable homicide statute, which, as you know, applies to law enforcement, um, it makes an amendment to that subsection instead. So it um, it sort of rewrites that subdivision to provide <coughs> that um, a uh, uh, some sort of harm or homicide occurs. Um, in the as a result of law enforcement using force or deadly force that's in compliance with the new standards <coughs> um, is considered justifiable homicide. Um, is, do, can you share it on the screen, Bryn? So I'm not a host, so I can't share it, um, but okay. I can send that if, if you'd like, I can send that particular um, language to Peggy and she can share it if that does it Does it? Yeah, separate? that's fine. Um, um, it's somewhat unusual um, to have, and this is part of the reason that all of this is so unusual. Uh, we're dealing with a house bill that we may not have an opportunity to have a conference committee on, that we may only have an opportunity to do um, concur with further proposal of amendment, may not even have that opportunity. I've tried to talk with Tim about it. So it's important that we keep in close contact with the house um, but I don't want to interrupt if Julio has any comments. But so if we could share that, um, Peggy. Um, uh, I uh, haven't received it yet, Bryn, but I did make you a co-host, so you might be able to share it. Well, let me forward it to Peggy. And then you could forward it to every member. I yeah. just sent and, it. I just sent it to Peggy. Um, OK, so well, I just I, did, too. Okay. <laughs> And just to be clear, this new draft hasn't um, yet been reviewed by the House Judiciary Committee. There's just a couple of members of that committee that have been working on it over the weekend. Um, so they haven't yet had a walkthrough of this new language and Julio hasn't seen it yet. So it's a little, um, just hey, to make Bryn, sure while we're figuring out how to get this document to everybody, can I ask you a question out of basic ignorance? S-219 is now an act having been signed by the governor. Can the House come along with a proposal that we can subsequently in the same session revise a provision? Yeah, so the, the I think that you're speaking specifically about that prohibited restraint language. Um, so because that, um, 
there are portions of that bill that don't take effect until um, until later. In fact, um, I October believe, 1st, right? Yeah, October 1st is a prohibited restraint. And I believe that that repeal um, <laughs> takes place um, in July, on July 1st of 2021. Okay. So yes, we you can you that I think that the idea is to I think the idea that everybody discussed was was amending that language um, prior to it taking effect. Interesting. Do you guys see it now? I put it up there. So yep. if, yeah. If you don't mind scrolling down, you'll see that all of this language in yellow. I'm I'm not sure that the committee has time to talk about all of these changes right now. But those I don't are all think changed. we do. I, I still want to stick with Julio. <laughs> but the, yeah, if you if you want this to is just a crazy way to try to deal with bills, and I, I it, it, I'm beginning to wonder if I, I did send an email this morning to Tim Ash, um, with my concerns about this process. I am very concerned that we're um, allowing a bill to pass with significant, significant changes. Um, as if we are a unicameral legislature. And I, I appreciate the House's willingness to keep us abreast of the changes going on, but it's hard to get testimony scheduled um, <clears throat> and then have, like Julio this morning, and then have a new draft already available that um, he hasn't had a chance to see. So it's very difficult. Um, I appreciate Representative Grads trying to keep in touch with me, but I, I am really concerned. Um, uh, and Senator Sears, if I, if I might, you know, the other weird thing about this situation is that we're in September now. Uh, so, you know, if this turns around and gets signed in this short session, it's going to come into force in October. Um, so waiting until January is not a crazy idea, uh, at which point we go back to a much more normal process. So I, I haven't seen the draft that was just shared. I haven't had a time to really look it over. It could be that it, you know, rests really comfortably with what we did in 219 yeah. and, and I would feel better about it. But the draft we have been looking at um, you know, what's to be gained by rushing something in, in order to get a couple of months. Uh, I, I think honestly, the only reason to do it is to prevent provisions in 219 from coming into law. Well, another... Senator Sears. Yep. May I, um, I, th yeah. I believe that, I think that the comments that you've made and that Senator Baruch just made are are important. And I th thought that we had heard from a number of people, including Mike Sherling and Susanna Davis and a number of other people that trying to rush something through just to get it through is not necessarily the best thing to do. And that it might make more sense as Senator Baru said to wait until January and really try to get it right. We may not. Yes, I don't disagree. Um, on the other hand, uh, I want to, I believe that this draft and Bryn, um, I believe this draft tries to address some of the concerns that we expressed at our last meeting. Um, yes, I, I think I would characterize two of the major changes as um, returning to the Senate version of the way that the standard or the policy describes prohibited restraint. It provides that law enforcement may not use a prohibited restraint for any reason. Um, and then it, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, it does not repeal that um, justifiable homicide subsection and instead it revises it to provide that law enforcement um, use of force that's in compliance with those standards um, could result in a justifiable homicide defense. Well, that entire statute needs reworking. Yeah, if you if you the, the, you know the the reference to 
mistresses and masters and everything else. Right. It does make some um, other amendments to that language. If you if you look at section two, um, there are some other amendments that are made to the entire statute. The that one. The... Yeah, the justifiable homicide uh, statute, and that's in section. I know it's not on your screen right now. It's in section two. Um, but it does right. update some of that language um, and make some grammatical changes that um, that should make the statute easier can, to understand. Can we come back to this on Friday when Julio and others have had an opportunity to look at their proposed changes to 119 and 124? That works for me. I don't know. If I'm asking anyone. I'm asking Julio, I'm asking you, I'm asking Peggy. I believe we have Friday open. We don't have an agenda item yet. Mr. Chair, I'm available Friday if the committee needs me. Yes. That is correct. Senator Sears, yep. I have to, Friday, I have to take um, Bill for oh. his post-op on Friday morning. And I don't know that they've made any changes to 124 yet. Well, okay. Well, why don't we just stick with 119 then? Because 124 is in government ops. So if we is, can all come back together. Can, yeah, can Senator, I just, Senator Benning, yeah. I'm, I don't know whether it is, um, if the consensus of the committee is that we not try to force feed this through this year. I guess for myself, then I would be asking, why do we want to have an agenda item on something that we're not gonna actually act upon? And, and I'll tell you personally, Dick, my law practice is falling apart around me as I try to deal with this extended session. I was really hoping we would be out of here by now. So adding things just to have something on the agenda to talk about is someplace I would prefer not to go. I'm going to defer to the chair's decision on what you want to do, but I just have to say that for myself personally, I don't want to spend time talking about something if we're not actually going to act on it. And I'll leave it at that. Well, my concern is we're the ones that kill this bill and I don't want to be in that position for this session and so I was hoping that we would be able to work something out with the other body that would get us a bill and it seems like they've moved closer to our position on some of this with the new draft so that's so why I, I think it it's behooves us to not as long as they're continuing to work on it, it behooves us to continue to work on it. And I understand that. I mean, in my personal life is also, I think all of us have been impacted. I've got a, you know, my, my, I've got doctor's appointments and things, not this week, but next week that are gonna keep me from some of these meetings. It's gotten uh, just, you know, this whole idea that we can just drop our lives the other thing I, I want to say is, too, is many of us have campaigns to run. And unfortunately, um, this is this this extended session has given a tremendous advantage to um, non incumbents. I think we saw that in the primaries. Dick, yep. I, I think that I, I might fall somewhere between you and Joe. In other words, what what is keeping me curious about going forward is what what is in this draft. So I, you know, I definitely want to sit with it and and look it over. So I'm free Friday, and I would I would be happy to be looking it over on Friday. But I I know what Joe's saying about um, if the committee feels like we might go forward with something, then I think Friday makes sense. The other thing I want to say is, um, you know, the House has made it very clear, as have a number of the advocates, that slowing down the process should not be a dirty word um, because we want to get it right. Uh, I heard loud and clear from Michael Sherling that they really want uh, this bill not to be pushed through 
that they want more consideration. So I, I don't think we're in the same position we were in at the end of the last session. If we were to say that we were gonna take this up in January, I don't think there would be an outcry because what we're, what we're doing here is much, you know, Michael Sherling kept calling it a statutory overlay and that's, that's right. And we should know exactly what we're doing. But again, the caveat of whatever is in this draft might be acceptable in a way that what I've seen so far isn't. So uh, I, I can't really say one way or the other until I've looked at it. Okay. Well, we'll meet Friday and those who obviously can't make it, they can't make it. As long as Senator Nick and myself and Baruth are here. And Joe, if you need to take time away, take time away. And you know, we understand that this is a citizen legislature. And I think as citizens, the expectation is that we, um, especially for those of you with another job, I don't have another job, so um, I'm retired, luckily, but um, those of you with another job need to need to be there too. So I understand that. Alice, you've been silent. I can be there Friday. Um, I am concerned that, you know, doing this as we're doing it, just getting piece by piece here mm -hmm. uh, is, is hard to do, to get the whole picture and what's changing and what places and what those changes will mean. I am oh. concerned about that, um, you know, to be able to really look it over carefully. Yep. And I guess the other thing is, the, so the, as I understand it, the whole uh, House Senate Judiciary has not taken a look at this. It's just the first of us. Yep. I don't know if it's the same group that's working on this now. It's not clear to me. Bryn, do you know, is it the same group of people that did the summer work? Yes. Yes. Um, it's, you know, a couple of members of the Senate or the House Judiciary Committee have been sort of taking the lead on doing the work over the summer and now. Um, and that's correct that the whole committee hasn't yet had a had a walk through this new draft. Uh huh. In fact, I don't. This if this is this is the first time um, it's public. It hasn't gone on, even on their web their committee web page yet. I see. Oh. There could uh, be more changes. I'm going to suggest that um, we do try the eleventh. Um, for uh, to look at where they're at, but that looking at that, that's two weeks from the date that the legislature is due to adjourn on the 25th. Um, that should give us a pretty good idea if there's something that changes we need to make during the week of the um, 14th. Um, okay. And um, give us an opportunity to have input into those changes and then we can make a final decision um, around the 17th. Uh, for example, I, what Joe just said, I've got a doctor's appointment on the 16th for minor surgery in the morning. Then on the 18th, my wife has a vision appointment that I can't miss. So, I mean, I'm going to be missing some of those days too. So we're all in that um, mode um, and, uh, and and so uh, I think we just need to make a final decision by the 17th okay and I hopefully uh, Tim we can talk with Senator Ash um, about this and his thoughts on it um, I have you know as I said I've sent him an email I also have reached out to the CSG Justice Center and hope to hear from somebody from there in law enforcement as well. And Bryn sent them copies of the bill. But that, that here's the problem, Bryn sent them copies of a bill that no longer is relevant, so. Hmm. All right, Julio, thank you very much for spending time with us. I'm sorry it wasn't more productive. But sometimes they change things in the middle of the stream.
I understand. That's okay, when you well, think you're you're going downstream, you turn upstream. Oh, well, I'll wait, uh, wait an invitation for Friday from Peggy. Yep. And uh, I'll see you then. And, um, okay. and Brand, if you could send me, if you haven't already, the, the latest draft and just keep the, the one that you, you were talking about today. And just if there are other drafts that come up from the house, just make sure I have it. Uh, I'll check in with you Thursday to make sure I'm current. Um, I'm sure that Peggy will post this version on the committee webpage. So it's okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Ask you that. So you want me to post that now, Bryn? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Thank you, committee. Um, we're an understanding group. Oof. All right. Uh, continuing with our it just never ceases to amaze sometimes um, so continuing with our efforts to understand the budget for 2022 with the, with breaking recommendations perhaps to the appropriations committee we have john campbell and annie noonan to present the state's attorneys and sheriff's budgets uh, sheriffs don't have any budgets, right? Just doing away with them. <laughs> We've already I mean, looked their, at that. I mean, with their budget items, there's no need for them to be there. They don't need any budget items, do they? Uh, Annie, I, I, I'm not sure if you're if you're being serious or not, Senator. So I'll just. Well, I heard that they're broke. <laughs> so. Everybody's broke. Now there, there. Um, yeah, Annie has, I believe, uh, she'll be addressed. She's right across the room from me, by the way. We're socially distant. Oh. We, okay. Uh, in the in the office, um, I understand that you said that you were not employed. I, I, with your hat on today, I was just wondering whether um, you, they were thinking about bringing you up from minors. Uh, this is <laughs> this is what's commonly referred to as a tank season. Um, but we're doing it on purpose. I think the Yankees are doing it by mistake. Uh, what can you do? What can you say? My Dolphins start on Sunday. We'll see what happens with them. Yeah, watch out for Cam. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be an interesting, interesting matchup. It is. Uh, Anyhow, uh, do you? In all seriousness, um, you have budget challenges that. Um, are going to be difficult from what the governor's office proposed for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Yeah, uh, first of all, John Campbell for Executive Director of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, here today. It's myself, Andy Nooney, and Andy Newton and Barb Bernardini uh, are in the office again, social distancing, so we can present this to you. You know, this this year, uh, you guys have an extremely difficult time. So, and so does, of course, all the you know agencies and departments in the uh, uh, in state government, with trying to figure out how we are going to um, afford or how we're going to be able to make it through the the next year. And you know, we've been, we've been sitting here and probably have adjusted our budget, you know, at least a, a dozen times trying to. Uh, cut here, cut there, because originally the uh, exercise given to us by the governor's office was uh, a 6% cut, and it was just impossible without cutting personnel, because I think, as all of you know, um, almost all of our budget uh, for the state's attorneys is uh, personnel. And, uh, you know, there's other that is for, um, you know, depositions for experts and, and uh uh, office supplies and the like, but the majority of our budget is all personnel. And what's truly difficult to try to figure out this year, and I think Joe, Joe can um, uh, speak to this, is that we don't know what's going to happen going forward. Um, you know, currently we're we're six positions or uh, six people short right now, six deputies. Um, and the fact is that most cases are in a, almost in a holding uh, pattern because um, you know the defendants and uh, no i'm not complaining about this in the sense that i would if i was their attorney i'd probably recommend the same thing most of the defendants are just they're in a wait and see pattern as well 
because um, you know we we try to see if uh, if some cases can be settled, some but uh, the, the party has said guilty and is waiting is asked for trial. So uh, what happens is that when when dike breaks uh, and when the um, we go back to uh, do trials, uh, then you're going to have a plethora of cases uh, that all want you know to go to trial, and that's going to be so backlogged. Uh, you know the the number of people personnel that are going to be needed, both uh, not just with us but also the defense bar. Um, I you know I'm sure Matt's probably told you it's going to be very difficult for them to do their job uh, with just the the personnel once this thing uh, goes back. Uh, and once people are asking for trial. You were kind of breaking up there, John, at my end. I don't know if the others were. Yeah, and I'm sorry. You were breaking up. You you froze up there. So I did? I didn't know if you asked a question. No, I said oh. you were breaking up on my oh. end, but I don't know if it was me or you. It well, anyway, I'll just continue on. If there's, um, I got to put my glasses. See you guys. So, um, John, I can only hear about every fourth word of yours, and now you're completely. But frozen the governor's I uh, recommend. I can't hear anything. Bill, Annie, can you uh, hear? If Josh, John can't. The. Uh, I, I, John, again, we I'm can't hear you. Yeah, we've lost you, John. Annie, can you hear us? And then I'll see. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John, we're having a difficult time hearing you. You keep breaking up. John, Annie, turn, up, turn off your video. I think he did. Oh, you got to finish. I'm wondering, can the committee hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. we can hear you clearly. No, boy. Maybe if John will just turn off his video, we'll uh, be able to just hear his voice. Thanks. I think, I think so. Did. There we go. Do you want to use my, John, come over and use my computer. Switch. <laughs> We're going to switch so John can come on my computer. Do the state, does your department oh. need new computers? Yeah, actually, it's not computers we need. It's, but I think I'm coming in over there, Andy. I'm sorry. We just want to lower. The and now, Andy needs to shut that computer off, or shut the mute up. Yeah, mute that turn that one off. I just like the top sound button. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So um, the the uh, the matter is complicated by the fact that we have um, one domestic violence prosecutor in uh, Bennington or Wyndham County. And uh, that's in jeopardy, uh, at least for at, at least half time of it. Uh, and then the uh, investigator in Bennington County, uh, which that was all from a grant. We don't have usually have investigators, but there was a grant um, that provided uh, Bennington with that. If you recall, these were funded positions from uh, the center. And then uh, they reassigned all the different um, grants uh, a couple of years ago. So we went out and found a grant to cover that. But unfortunately, uh, that was tied to um, the language from the federal, the, the federal, uh, the DOJ had required us to put in, um, as you know, which I think you, guys, you all put in, in S-234, which was um, given the victim of a uh, sexual assault the right to uh, ask that her, that the defendant or the defendant after uh, problem after arraignment could be tested uh, for the presence of HIV or other sexually transmitted uh, diseases. 
uh, which was have been, would have been a confidential and the results only given right. to the victim, of course, the victim's doctor. Uh, and, and, S, uh, and S 234, we passed the language so that they would be made whole and that the federal government would approve it. The House Health and Wealth, Health, not Health and Welfare, the Health, the House Health Care Committee did not like the provision um, because a uh, one group complained. So they have threatened to take all of S-234 into their committee if it's not stricken. So you have a $40,000 hole. Is it for this year or for the next three years? Is it over a three-year period? Is it 40,000 yeah, or is it going to be? It's, it's over a three-year period, which means that. So it's uh, about right. 15,000 a year? Yes. So I would propose that we uh, urge the, ho the House, if the House puts in the 15K mm -hmm. to make those positions whole, uh, or if they don't, I would, I would propose we, we urge the Senate to do the same. Senator Probst. Does everybody follow what happened? The House took the language that we put in S-234 out. Who was it that oppo uh, opposed it? I can't remember. Uh, Here, you, you want me to explain? Go ahead, John. Yeah. yeah. So, so what happened was that went over to the House, and then um, the network decided that they were not going to offer an opinion, uh, offer testimony in support of it, uh, and had conversations with Maxine or with uh, Representative Grad, uh, where they were concerned because there were people in their organization uh, in the HIV community that were opposed to it because they felt that it was stigmatizing to anyone who had HI HIV. Um, this had nothing to do with the, you know, with people who had HIV. This, you know, this was limited strictly to, uh, you know, a person who was uh, arraigned uh, and uh, for sexual assault and the testing, the results of the testing would be just uh, remain with that person, with the defendant and also uh, with the with the victim. Um, so uh, the I, we, I kept on trying to discuss, I've discussed it with a lot of people and, and then the organization, the advocacy group that decided uh, that they were totally opposed to it. Um, then they have uh, asked, well, I'll tell you what, we'll come to a compromise if you give us $10,000 uh, to come up with designing some programs for you, uh, then we'll, you know, we can think about uh, supporting it, which I find personally offensive. Um, and there's just no way in the world that I would recommend that our department spend a dime um, on, on the situation. And I, I just find it uh, important actually that it occurred. But again, that's neither here nor there. Uh, we're, we're concerned about you know, being able to provide, you know, people in Bennington and Wyndham counties with uh, the, uh, with the, these individuals that are helping um, with domestic violence cases. So I think those are the most important. So however it's done, if the state wants to uh, backfill the feds, that's fine. Um, and uh, so I thank you, Senator, for, for doing that. But that again, is just um, one of the needs that we have for the uh, for the personnel, and Andy will go into that more in detail. Well, and, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yep. So, did the House not see this little bribery scheme here? I don't know if they're familiar, that if they were personally made aware of that yet. I have not discussed it with Representative Grad or anyone in that. Well, it was Health and Wealth, it was the Health Committee for Human Services, I thought. Well, my no, I, I think no, it was what my understanding. Well, my understanding is that uh, what we were told is that if it does go, if the if the uh, House Judiciary Committee, if they had put that language in two thirty four, then um, the Health Committee would take it into their committee because right. the committee uh, chair uh, was absolutely opposed to, to any of this this type of language. Where it comes from, I could just give you a, a quick so you understand because I was totally perplexed is this is a national movement where the HIV community is afraid that it's a slippery slope because um, there are two states, I believe there are a few states down south that, that uh, if you have been, um, in, if you've had HIV and you transmit to somebody else, uh, then you can uh, be charged with, with a crime. 
of course, that's not what we're doing. Not even talking about that. I, I don't think that's right. I, I would not support um, any law like that. But I think they were, you know, they felt that you know, this is just sort of a, a foot in the door, which, as we all know, I mean, that's the one one thing you always hear about the slippery slope. I, I just don't see it in this. I think that a victim who has been sexually assaulted certainly has the right to know whether you know, she's going to be tested. And, and there, the discussion goes on. It's a lengthy discussion, probably. Um, you know, too much for right here, but I'd be more than happy to, you know, to share with you or talk to you offline if you want. Senator. I, I, I think we should move on. Yeah. Um, are there ever other areas of the budget where you need money that uh, that didn't get appropriated by the governor yeah. or is not may not be in the House bill? Here's where I think our biggest pressure comes outside of that. And this pressure is one that will not only affect us, but it, it, it's it's um, it, it's tentacles going to reach you know far are, are going to be far reaching, and you all are familiar with it. Uh, and that is uh, with their case management uh, problem, the case management system. Um, we were told by the vendor, our vendor currently, Journal Technologies, that as of June next year, they consider this system to be outdated and will no longer support it. Um, even uh, more complicated than that is that they will not create any what's called security patches. So Mark Coombs, um, who is the uh, head of the um, uh, for uh, ADS, who's head of the, uh, the tech there, uh, said there's just impossible for us to have this on, on the state system uh, at all uh, without security patches. Um, also, we've been working with Dan Smith from Joint Fiscal because this involves interaction with the courts system, with their Odyssey system. Um, without this case management, we will not be able to um, integrate completely with them. And it's, it's just like, it's nonstop. We, we have talked to Tyler, who is actually the, the manufacturer for Odyssey, um, thinking that what the best way, as you all know, some of the problems that we've been encountering is um, go with Tyler because then you have a fully integrated system. Everybody, the, the computers are all talking to each other. They're talking the same language. And um, so we, we were looking to go towards to them and they can make the total conversion for us, but it's going to be um, like 1.4 million over a couple of years. Andy, Andy will go over that. And we have, we, right now we have about 350,000 that we can put towards that. Um, but we have to make a decision almost immediately because the vendor we have is now telling us they're not going to host us any longer if we don't upgrade to one of their programs. Um, and honestly, I was, uh, we, we, we had a conference with them, a phone conference, or a teleconference like this with them the other day. I've, I've been very concerned about their uh, management uh, and about the strength of their company for a number of reasons, but this did not, the call did not make us feel any better, let's just put it that way. So if we get stuck in the middle of nothing, then everything comes grinding to a halt because then we won't be able to uh, go in and do any electronic filing. Um, and it's gonna be extremely problematic. Um, unfortunately, this was not something that we saw uh, happening because we didn't think that they were going to all of a sudden stop. We just found that out uh, in, I believe, Andy was in February or March that we found that out, right before the, uh, the pandemic. So, so that's our next the biggest pressure. I, I'm not, I won't go into the little ones and let Andy tell you the ups and downs, but that one certainly is um, is one where we, we did put in for COVID funds and we, I believe very uh, sincerely that they, that they should be um, go to that because this involves all the remoteness that we're talking about that we're going to probably have to do for the next few years. And um, we can't do it unless we have, you know, this other you know, system. So uh, but I, the problem with the COVID funds are spending it in time. And now I don't, uh, I don't need yeah. to go. I don't need to go through the. We don't need to go through the ups and downs. We just want to know what above the governor's recommend you okay. would. You if need, I could have any, uh, any, we'll go ahead and address these numbers then. Oh, okay. Come over here. Sorry. <laughs> We got about five minutes left. So great, thank you, senators. Uh, good morning. Um, they don't want the up okay. I'm sorry, and I didn't hear your question. So I think um, uh, probably the most important thing is for us is the the current vacancies um, and how to how uh, 
how to figure out if there's a way to get some funding to fill those. Uh, John mentioned the two biggest pressures for the department are, are basically being down six positions since 2018. We have four vacancies, which we were originally budgeting for this year. They were in our budget. And then as a result of some of the cuts, uh, it looks like we can fill only two of the four that we had planned on filling this year. So that will leave, there's tremendous pressure on those offices, but we also know that there's pressures uh, in other, other offices um, with our caseload numbers are just going up and up. Um, we did get some relief from the uh, state um, uh, finance and management. They gave most of the departments some relief on their internal um, uh, service fees. And that was helpful. And that came to, to us to be about $37,000. But really what we need um, would be money to fill, to fill the additional two vacancies um, uh, that we have. Um, and then as John mentioned, this whole issue with the case management system. Uh, we have only about $300,000 that we could put towards it. Um, we are working with um, both joint fiscal office and with ADS to put together an RFP, but we do have a pretty good sense of what a, an integrated system with the court might look like. And John is correctly quoting that um, we look, it looks like it might cost us upwards of about 1.2 1. 1. million. Um, that would be obviously um, something we had hoped originally that we would have some ability to cover that through COVID um, funds. But as you know, December 31 is quickly approaching and those monies need to be expended by that and you can't pay for things. The feds will not allow you to pay for, for kind of upfront for certain things. So we're really struggling with, with all of that. Well, we did well, we, work. We're hopeful that those rules will change, that Congress will do something um, between now and then, and that would give the and I, I my understanding from Representative Welsh is that Congress is pretty well aligned to at least give more flexibility on the CARES Act funds that we've already received. That would be really great. And what are the, one of the things, Senators, that we did receive? Um, so I think you probably know that a lot of the courts are doing things uh, remotely. Uh, we did we did get approval and are working towards getting Cisco endpoints put into into our offices because we were not able to we didn't have that kind of technology and we were able to do some upgrading of some computers in the field uh, for people who also had five and six year old computers and were not able to effectively um, remote in. Um, so we are able to do that. Um, you heard through some of your other I think uh, some of the senators on this committee have also heard. Uh, some of our challenges with um, uh, just the workload pressure that has come to us as a result of the court's new systems, and those are real. Um, and, uh, you know, our estimate in some of our offices is the filing issues are, are creating a lot of uh, administrative work. But what we really could use would be assistance with getting our four vacancies filled and potentially some support for our IT need as John said, that uh, we are we are in no you know we're basically out of out of commission with a system next this coming June, um, and that was sprung on us and and all the other users uh, you know uh, that this company has in the field. Uh, we all learned about that at the same time by a letter saying we're dumping that project. We've considered it an aged out project, so we're not going to support it anymore. We have asked them if we would uh, if they would work with us on a deal to give us some tech support for a year. They told us they are not inclined to do that. Um, and I guess they are trying to push people into their new product, but we really aren't at a point of making that decision yet. So that would be good news, Senator, if the um, federal government would give us some more time to spend some of that COVID money, but uh, the CARES Act money. But right now, um, uh, the amount of money we could we would really need to help us get those other positions filled, if we were only talking you know, two, the, the last two of the four would, if we, probably we would need about $270,000 when you're loading in salaries and benefits, all, all, all expenses. Well, that's- uh, are, you, are you requesting 270,000 above the governor's recommend? Uh, for to fill yes to fill the two that we don't have any money for senator that's our best projection about what we would need yes so the answer on that would be John's saying I'm not allowed to ask so I don't know are we asking uh, yes yes 
I would say, I'd say yes. I mean, and then John can fire me later. <laughs> All right. So for the committees, the, the, the three things you're asking for are 13,000 per year for the next three years for the Bennington, Wyndham County state's attorneys. I think, I think it's, and yeah. 270,000 for, for two more positions over what the governor so you're down six, you're filling two, and you'd fill two more, so it'd only be down two. We'd be that down. That's correct. That okay. That's correct, Senator. We would. We're we're down six. We have enough money to fill two in our own budget. We would be requesting enough money to fill other two more. I mean, preferably, we would like to fill three. Um, that would be a, that would be our best our best situation now. But we didn't want to seem greedy. I will, um, does the committee want to weigh in on these three requests? Which the second yes. request is really, we don't have much at this point to do with because it's pressure on a, on a system. And obviously we've had little influence on the judiciary's odyssey system. That's too. Right. I, I would say that for Windsor County, yes, they're having a hard time because they're down positions. I'm, I'm just asking committee, do you want to recommend to the to the Senate Appropriations Committee that they fund 13,000 per year for three years for the DV positions and 270,000? I don't know where the committee will find the Appropriations Committee has the money, but 270,000 for two more deputy state's attorney positions. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Matt's going to come in and ask for 400,000 um, because tomorrow Matt Valerio has a, um, because of care, what was going to be CARES Act funding is not, a, uh, has been ruled not appropriate. So he has a $400,000. So. Senator Sears? Yes. I, I think that um, I agree that they need this money and I would be supportive of recommending that the Appropriations Committee um, look at it favorably. I also realize that probably our, uh, the other committees that we serve on are also asking the Appropriations Committee to um, put additional money in other areas. So I would support this one and then leave it to the Appropriations Committee to try to figure out how to, how to do that. Well, since two members of this committee are on the appropriations committee, I, I I'd like to put it on the list. We'll put it on, put the, it list on the list and see what happens. I just yes. no guarantee, but at least it'll be on the list. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to say anything else, John? Oh. Joe or okay. Phil, do you have any comments on that? I don't. Anything else, John or Annie? No, uh, Senator, the, um, I will just say that um, our other two sections of the budget are SIU. Uh, we feel we can manage with uh, what we have in front of us for the year. We've talked to Mark Matera and I think we're, we're Mark's able to manage that. Um, the sheriffs, um, their rescission was about $145,000. Their carry forward was 102. They've been in obviously in an unusual year uh, since since the courts closed down. Um, most of the senators know that what we pay for from the money that comes to the department is the sheriff's salaries and benefits are paid out of our appropriation, as are the 25 state transport deputies. Um, since the courts have been um, idled uh, for in person and we have not been moving um, uh, folks from the correctional facilities back and forth, most of what, uh, although there have been some, there have been some extraditions and there have been some travel, but, but it's much limited. I, uh, the other thing that, that, that they have been able to do because the statute provides that for them is that the state transport deputies, when they are not engaged in transportation, are permitted to uh, engage in general law enforcement duties in their counties. And we've been working with the sheriffs uh, to make sure that they're clearing those 
those assignments with us to make so that we're watching to make sure that there's not any type of you know double charging you know charging a, a private contract and then being on the state time so we're working closely with the sheriffs to make sure that they're using our state transport deputies properly um, some of them are doing the monitoring of the um, the hotels and motels where they've put up uh, homeless people uh, the proprietors that was part of the deal that they had to have some law enforcement presence so the sheriffs have been doing that they've also just basically been involved with some of the work around the schools um, and the school districts you know uh, being in, you know being on the campuses of the schools to you know watch and provide some security support um, and then just generally uh, having a presence in the local communities which I think is very important um, right now for a lot of the small communities to have just to have some of the presence of the sheriffs uh, being available. So we've used them. If, I think most of the departments have, have been very, very um, uh, active in terms of using them, um, some more than others, but we're, we're, uh, we're looking at all of how that's happening. So they will be able to manage under their, under their budget, the budgets that have been presented to them for 21. We're confident we can manage those budgets. So there's no asks in either of those two areas, Senators. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Thank you, Senator. I wasn't aware. I, I am concerned about the use of the sheriff's transport deputies in general law enforcement and how that's all um, playing out. Um, so uh, hopefully the auditor of accounts will be looking at that. We may, I do I, talk I may, with... I, I do talk with Doug Hoffer. He calls me pretty regularly. We do check-ins back and forth, and I'm aware of um, the auditor's um, questions and concerns, and I try to guide the sheriffs based upon um, well, my I'm conversation. I'm concerned that, for example, if the sheriff ha and has an, uh, if the sheriff of Rutland County has a contract with Wallingford, is the Wallingford contract being covered by a transport deputy um, who? then is, you know, and as this whole thing needs to be, um, I, that would be my concern. Um, I think we agree. Or is, he, or is the sheriff of Rutland County putting two deputies, one the contract and the other, one of his transport deputies in Wallingford and providing extra service to that community? We agree that um, I think the statute has not been particularly clear with, um, with what we expect. And I think that, that the, sh the executive committee of the sheriffs agree a conversation at some point to clarify the roles and responsibilities um, and what they do when they're not transporting um, what, what we would like them to do. I think that we would agree that that's a, that's a proper conversation and a, 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 a long needed conversation for us to be having with, um, with, with the legislature and with the auditor. Senator yep. Sears? Yes, Senator White. I, I just have to say that um, the whole way we fund and um, provide access by the sheriffs is just the craziest system that was ever devised. And it was as if we put some people in a room and said, come up with the most insane system you can think of. And this is what they came up with. And they're not, they, they ran into a lot of issues um, around the pen that were made clearer because of the pandemic that they're not eligible for certain things um, from SBA, for example, because they're considered government, but they're not, um, they weren't eligible for PPEs because they were considered government, but they're not eligible for other things because they're considered um, entrepreneurs and businesses. So. They're, they're caught in this really odd bind. And I think but, we need to look at the whole, the whole way well, we- I think it's more than an odd bind. In my opinion, it's more than an odd bind. You have a situation where you have uh, officers funded by the state, 25 officers funded by the state who are under the control of the sheriff who can use them in various manner. <clears throat> and when the state's not transporting prisoners in a regular basis, those officers are out doing other stuff that the state is paying for. It doesn't make sense. And any other, I mean, if, if, 
it it just is a um, um, and so I'm concerned at um, this situation and uh, I'm not suggesting that any of our sheriffs uh, would do this, but um, it would be pretty easy to, you know, you've got a sheriff who's covering a hotel. I've heard from sheriffs that that uh, that Lamoille County had to cover Chittenden County's hotels because Chittenden County wouldn't cover the hotels. So how, how does that work? And what were those transport deputies doing? Yes, um, that is that I believe that that's accurate. And I, I'm not sure why the Chittenden County um, Sheriff's deputies were not engaged in that. I think that um, I know that Sheriff Marcou was and Sheriff Shatney and I think Sheriff Harlow um, were sending folks. And I, I think there were potentially some other sheriffs. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I know that, you know, one of the things that has been really interesting in, as I look at it, in, in, in how the uh, allowances for both state and federal provisions for the COVID no work have played out um, is that employees have been able to identify, um, ask for uh, FMLA leave for situations where their daycares were closed or their schools were closed or they themselves had um, concerns about pre-existing conditions. So I think that there have been some, uh, some of the um, uh, transport deputies have been on the COVID, um, COVID charge, the, what they call the COVID no work charge. Um, and I'm not, I have not looked into but, each of the, their, their reasons. Um, uh, you know, what, well, I, I don't think, I, but that, that's all I'm saying is that if the Chittenden County Sheriff refused to provide the <clears throat> hotels with deputies and the Orange, uh, the Lamoille County Sheriff did, what happened to the Chittenden County Transport deputies? Um, I, I believe, Senator, from what I've seen, uh, I think most of the Chittenden County Sheriff deputies have been on the COVID no work uh, charge charge code. Great. That's just great. I think we're digging a hole deeper and deeper, so maybe we should stop digging and climb out of the hole. So um, I think that's all I have to share. I did send Peggy our up and down and I sent Peggy um, a sheet that had our budget for the past few years, plus what the rescission meant for us to carry forward. Um, you know, and I, I, agree with, I agree with everything John said in terms of our needs are pretty much just our personnel filling, um, our, our um, dealing with that federal cut and um, obviously our IT need is going to be the big, the big driver for us coming up. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Senators. Have a good day. Thank oh, you. For, John says he got cut off, but thank you very much. Thank you, John. Sorry you got cut off. No problem. He's got a fancy computer. I got an old workhorse. Well, yours works. It's done. Mine works. Okay. Thanks, Senators. All right, committee. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Committee, uh, my plan is to um, go over the four items that they raised and um, ask the Appropriations Committee to also consider having the auditor to look into the use of transport deputies during the pandemic. Okay. Is there an opposition to that? No. Okay. Peggy, uh, we'll adjourn for the day and, and get back tomorrow morning at 10. Do, is our agenda pretty well set for tomorrow? Uh, yeah, tomorrow we're all set. We have each 962 and everyone's been confirmed and then Matt's coming in to do the budget. Okay, good. Thursday we have S119. We have Michael Sherling and Colonel Birmingham coming in. Good. Um, and then Friday we have S119, Julio Thompson. So. I think when, would you, um, just send a note to Michael Sherling that we'd like a discussion about how they see the governor's order, order, uh, order. That sounded like a Bostonian. The governor's order, um, how it impacts S one nineteen. Okay. 
And were there any other witnesses, Senator Sears? And I guess we should provide them, everybody, with the updated, the most updated version if Bryn could. Yeah. So that they're not talking about last week's version. Yep. Okay. And, and if I hear anything. From, on well, SB 119, I, let me know if you. If I, hear, I will. If the only ones that I would think of would be people from the um, Justice Center, if any of them okay. have got. Um, okay, let me know. All right. Thank Bye, you everybody. all very much. Thanks, Peggy, can right. I ask you a question? Peggy, just, sure. could I just ask you a question? Let me, let me end the live stream first, okay? Do you want yes. to let me know? Thanks.